I would mention something. Yesterday, after our last lecture, one of you has been here. One of you asked a question. And this happens often to us, not only here, in, also in Germany. We give a lecture and we ask you, please do you have questions? No. And after the lesson, come, people come and ask their questions. I understand this very well, that it's easier to ask a question when coming, when being alone after the lecture, because often you think, oh, I have a question, but this is a stupid question. However, I will try now to explain what a stupid question is. Sometimes people ask questions only in order to show, they ask them publicly, in order to show how well they understood. You know, that's what I call a stupid question. But when you really do not understand something, then it is a good question. And you must not be afraid to ask it. You may think, I am the only one who did not understand. But usually, all the others think, oh yes, that's exactly what I also did not understand. Maybe also that you think, oh, I cannot ask this question because the speaker will lose its face. He, he will be embarrassed. No. Don't bother for that. Well, so now the question was, I will repeat it because I think it was a very important question. Uh, so so it, it was really a good question. If I understood well the question, it is about the following. You have been talking for one hour about momentum and another hour about entropy but you still did not say what it actually is, momentum, and what is entropy. I will try to give an answer. But I also invite you to make your objections or to give your answers to this question. My first answer to it is perhaps not very fair. Fair, you understand? It's what not very nice. Mm -hmm. I answer with another question. Please tell me what is, finally, what is electric charge? Because I think you all believe you know what electric charge is. But you will be a little embarrassed when I ask you this question. So, and finally, we're in the same situation with momentum and with entropy. Yeah. But this was not a good answer. So, I will take the question more seriously. And maybe I will begin to ask this question in a more general sense, and I ask not only what is entropy, what is um, momentum, but I can ask it for any physical quantity. What is temperature, what is this? And if you ask it in this way, this general way, there are two possible answers depending on what the physical quantity, on which quanti quantity we consider. For instance, if you had asked, but finally, what is the electrical capacity, uh, capacitance, then the answer would be very simple. Uh, I could say the capacitance is uh, defined. Uh, I would say the capacitance is equal to this over this. And this is the, or the special case of physical quantities which are derived by other quantities. Of course, you know that we cannot define or explain all the physical quantities in this way because then you ask, and what is electric charge, what is the uh, uh, electric uh, potential difference, and so on. And then you come to a point where you cannot go on explaining a physical quantity by a derivation. So there are other quantities which we do not derive from other quantities, but which we consider as basic quantities. And these we can only define by explaining how we can measure their values by a measuring procedure. Some in the um, English language we say that this is an operational definition. You have to do an operation to get the values. Now, when defining a physical quantity in this way, in 
certain books or in many books, they describe mm -hmm. this procedure of defining the, the quantity in some more detail. They say in order to define a physical quantity operationally, you have to make sure or you have to guarantee three things. You have to declare what the unit is. You have to explain how you can make sure that the value on two systems is equal. And third point is you have to give a rule how to construct multiples. As an example, take the old temperature scale, the Celsius temperature, uh, centigrade temperature scale. Uh, you can say the unit is defined, uh, well, the unit must not be the definite unit, uh, but it must be a distance between two different temperature values. And, and in the case of the Celsius temperature, is the melting point of the ice and the um, boiling point of the water. Yeah. Equality is usually, it is trivial to, to guarantee for it. So, That's what's the most important point, which is really um, which matters most for the definition of physical quantity is how to define the multiples. Yeah, and this for temperature, for instance, is a very strange and complicated method because the rule is take mercury oh. and observe the uh, dilatation of it uh, when heating it. Uh, this is, is very arbitrary because you, taken, you could have taken any other substance and you would get another temperature scale. But this definition by the mercury gives you the multiples because you say you divide the whole interval by 100 and then um, you take equal lengths. And then you say this is one degree, this is two degrees, this is five degrees, and so on. So now if, you, if we come back to the question of but what is entropy and what is momentum, then we simply could say Okay, uh, we uh, use these uh, three criteria and um, we look, do we know already what entropy is? And then, you see, we have described up to now perhaps three hours of teaching the unit, we didn't define it yet. Okay, so you have, we have to wait, it will come a little later. Equality is trivial. For instance, entropy, you have two pots of water with the same amount of, um, of water in it and the same temperature, and then you can say, this is, same they contain equal amounts of entropy. Now, this criterion, which in some cases is very complicated, for instance, for the temperature, for the entropy and for the momentum, also is very simple. How can I define multiples of entropy? You take one glass of water, you take another one with the same quantity of water, same temperature, then you have, together you have to double. You take three, you have three, you take four, you have four times the entropy. This and this, we have it already. It's only this is missing. And this will come a bit little later. So, and now I have answered your question twice. The mm. first one was, um, do it like the electric charge, I gave it back. The next one was this answer. And if I was you, I would not be satisfied with both answers. Uh, why? Why? Uh, yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I understand the word. <laughs> um, because I think the important thing to understand, to have this question, which is very natural and very spontaneous, but I still don't understand. You give me all the explanations, how to get the value, how to measure it, and all these abstract definitions. I have the feeling I don't know what it is. Don't yeah. uh, and you so I think, and th I think the situation is the same for the pupils. It's not only our qu problem, it's the problem of the pupils. What they want to know is they want to connect the idea of the physical quantity with some something of their own experience, their everyday experience. And that is why we insist so much when beginning, uh, when, to in, when introducing this quantity for the first time, to begin with a description of everyday situations, 
like for the entropy, you have wa cold water and hold wa hot water, and you would say, much heat, in this is much heat, in this is few heat. Well, what you call, call heat is what the physicist calls entropy. Mm -hmm. Or consider you have a big truck running very quickly, you have a fly flying at the same velocity. One of them has more something. That's mm -hmm. momentum. Yeah. Yeah. And only after getting this intuitive feeling comes the physical details and they tell you how to determine values, how to compare exactly the uh, numerical values. Beginning with these more uh, rigorous definition of physical quantity is not so good because often it contains technical details which don't help to, uh, to get a, a good understanding of the, of, of the quantity. I remind you, I don't know um, how you are teaching, but at the electric current, for instance, I remember when I was a student, I had to learn an electric current of one ampere is when you have two wires in a distance of one meter uh, and between them acts a force of so many newtons. I don't know if you know that. One that, meter. yeah, yeah, that is definition there was in school books. It's so stupid. Nobody has to know this strange definition with the two uh, wires and the force which they never measured because the force is so weak. So this was the third answer to my question, to this question. And, and now comes the fourth one. Uh. There is a particu particular problem when the considered quantity is momentum. And I can, um, I just, I will mention this because it was also my own problem. When I learned physics and was mechanics, first I learned, well, all the usual stuff about forces and masses and Newton's law and all these things. And then at a certain moment, I learned it. this. So a body has, may have kine kinetic energy and he has much kinetic energy if it is quick and if it is heavy. So in our intuitive understanding of the world, we have a good feeling for this, quick and heavy. <coughs> so we associate it with impetus, momentum. Mm. Unfortunately, later, we learned another equation. And we learned momentum, a body has much momentum if it is quick and if it is heavy. So in my head, in my intuition, but quick and heavy means it has much kinetic energy. And now what is momentum? It is almost the same, but the Intu intuitive image is already occupied. It is occupied by this one. I will call this intuitive feeling, or the feeling for, for this impetu, which is a Latin word for it, for this. Uh, it's Latin word. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I did not remember the Chinese word, you, you know it. So anyway, if this is in our head associated with this, then we say, oh, momentum is a very complicated quantity because it's almost this, but not exactly. Mm -hmm. So for me as a student, among these two quantities, this was a more difficult one. But the only reason for it was that I learned this first. So now <coughs> let us, this is a kind of dilemma. Well, you can resolve it simply by the fact Begin with this one. Associate it with your intuitive idea of <coughs> and then this way, th this uh, quantity is a little more complicated. This is a kind of complicated derived quantity. Yeah. By the way, you can it, um, write also in this form, um. just transforming. Now you can uh, study this situation yet by another means. 
We are now all experts in analogies. We will translate this equation. You remember the table we had yesterday? Uh. In the electric uh, 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 relation, it reads E is M has to be translated into C by means of the table. And P is Q, M is C, and this is U. These are the electric analogs of these equations. In electricity, we do not have these problems. Why? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> because he, here, we proceed in a completely different way. We begin to introduce this, qu this quantity as a basic quantity. We, can, we do not say the charge is defined as uh, the product of this or that. And we have a relatively good intuitive idea about electric charge, although this is not easy. In our uh, intuitive idea, charge is what is sitting on this charged sphere, or when you pull your, the pullover over your hair, then it is charged. So it's something sitting on this. So you have a very direct idea of charge, and then you learn how to measure it and so on. So this is the primary quantity about with which we, with which we begin. And then they learn this is related to electric potential and we can and it is related to the energy of the electric field and so on. So now we propose to proceed here in the same way. This is our primary uh, um, mechanical, mechanical quantity. We associate it with impetu and all the rest is derived. Uh, so this was a very long answer to a very simple question. <laughs> I tell, tell, probably you, you thought it's a stupid question. I don't know, or an yeah. inconvenient question. It, it was a, I think oh, these questions uh, are more important yeah. than all the rest, but we are. Yeah. If you have m more questions, do not hesitate to answer. It is not so important that we finish with our program here. It is better to treat a few chapters and to understand them well instead of all of them and with little understanding. So if there are no questions at the moment, then we go on. We had seen momentum, uh, we got an, a relatively good idea what momentum is. We, the, this, we discussed many situations in which momentum was going from one place to another and we were able to describe where it goes. For instance, where this shock and then we could say momentum goes from one body to the other. Or we had this shock and then momentum is distributing over two bodies. Or we have this experiment, here's the bumper, the final bumper, tack, boom, the momentum has gone into the earth. You can make many more of these kind of experiments just to exercise, just to make them, feel them comfortable with the concept. One of them, which I did not mention yesterday, is the following. You have two chariots, two wagons, and uh, with, um, what is this plastiline bumper? Not elastic, the inelastic bumper. Two chariots, I give them a kick, tuck, Buff, finished. Now ask your pupils what has happened with the momentum. This had momentum, this had momentum, and then no momentum. Where has the momentum, where did it go? And ask a pupil who suspect, you suspect that he was sleeping. <laughs> and uh, the pupil will say, oh, oh, the momentum has gone into the earth. Because he knows that whenever momentum has disappeared and you don't know where it is, it is into the earth. And then there are other pupils who are not sleeping all the time and they say, no, 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 this cannot be. Sure. Then they say, typically they say, no, the momentum compensates. And that's the moment where we learn, oh, oh, yeah, when they say the momentum comp compensates, I ask, but <laughs> what do you mean by compensates? And then with some discussion, well now in particular in the 
junior high school, I remember this discussion, they are not yet so good in mathematics. <coughs> but after some discussion, they say, ah, yeah. One of them has positive and one must have negative momentum. And that's the first time they notice and they learn that momentum can be positive and negative. Yeah, now can you explain the experiment? Uh, well, this one, for instance, when I, after having kicked it, has five units of momentum, say five Huygens, and this one, minus five Huygens. So uh, what is the momentum before they shock? Plus five, plus minus five. How much is that? Ling. Ling, yeah. Yeah. And then they are shocked. Understand how much it is now? Again, zero. So everything is okay. And then we ask the ah, we now understand momentum can be positive or negative. That's different from entropy. You just heard that entropy can only be positive. No. And then comes what I mentioned yesterday in the discussion. Which one of these two has positive momentum? And to my surprise, there was always agreement. This one has positive momentum. Yeah. Yeah. But then we insist in saying, this is a convention. Yeah, you see it, for instance, simply, yeah. when a body moves in this direction, it has positive momentum for you. But for me, it moves to the left. How do we do? In order to communicate in the future, we always define it in that way that from your side to the right, it is positive momentum. This was a description of a detail of the teaching for the junior high school because in the senior high school, I told you we are working with vectors and I jumped the corresponding chapter. So I don't know, you can do it this way or in that way. Without the vectors, then you jump always the vector chapters or uh, with vectors, then you mm -hmm. have all the problems we had yesterday in the discussion, you know. You know. So, then yesterday you learned momentum always goes from high to low velocity. If you do want to make it simply, throw your book in this, opla, in this direction. Momentum goes from here to here. If you want to make it complicated or discuss about science, then you can also throw it in this way. And you will see the rule holds, but the arguments are a little more complicated. Well, so <coughs> momentum goes from high to low velocity, we have this. Now comes a new chapter, which is not so new for you because you just, just learned it in the context of thermodynamics. When teaching, I give you the titles of the chapters in order to let you know where we are. When teaching, I don't give the title because here, this is already the answer of a question that we will treat when teaching. PowerPoint is good, but I never use it, almost never use it when teaching. So, I could sh show you the next PowerPoint, but if I prefer to use the blackboard, or even better, I make the experiment. <coughs> These are experiments that are completely trivial. Often you say, I make an experiment because I have a question to the nature and the experiment will answer. Okay. These experiments are of a different kind. They just show what we are speaking about. So what you need for my mechanics lessons is different chariots or wagons. You need a wagon like this. Oh, you can have a small one, but it is better to have a big one. For instance, we have in our schools tables with wheels in order to bring the experiments into the uh, classroom. Uh, you know this? this will do. So, I have this wagon and I pull and the momentum increases. Um, Oh no, better, let me begin. I push it. I will get the push. And I wait, and the table will roll, and then we come to a stop. And then I ask, well, it had momentum, and now the momentum is away, where, does it, where did it go? Of course, it went into the earth. 
Well, we always, we made a couple of experiments and always we ask, where has the momentum gone? But up to now, we did not ask, where does it come from? And now I'm pulling this table and I ask you, there is momentum is going into the chariot. And now you ask, where does it come from? And what do the pupils answer? Their answer is, you give them. That's it. That's it. <laughs> they say it's coming from myself. So they say, but if the momentum is coming from myself, then my own momentum must decrease. But it does not decrease because I'm standing. I'm pulling like this. <laughs> so I will not describe the details of how the conversation goes on. But finally, we arrive at the conclusion that the momentum is coming from the Earth. Maybe that some pupils do not, are not really convinced that this is true. So we make this experiment. I have, uh, I for instance, on inline skates or on um, um, a skateboard. That's all a very useful instrument, skateboards. Well, it mustn't be you who, do, who does it. Usually the kids are more able to do it. This is Lily. And um, she's pulling. And now you see what's happening. This, uh, uh, the wagon, the wagon's uh, momentum increases. And Lily's momentum increases negatively. She will move there. So it decreases. So this is Whaley. Uh, now, I mean, this way. we have two wagons. He is standing on the skateboard. So you can be sure that his momentum will, he, he, well, he will pull. And you can be sure that his momentum will not change because he is insulated. There's uh. momentum insulation. So anyway, what we observe is this chariot moves in this direction, this and this. So this momentum increases. This momentum increases negatively, so momentum goes from here to here through uh, whaling. So we had the rule, before we had the rule, momentum goes uh, spontaneously from high to low velocity, and here we now say that momentum goes from the earth, low velocity, to the chariot, which, uh, which has the higher velocity. But the momentum does not do this on its own. It has to be forced, we can say. It goes only because here we have Wheelie who makes an effort. So we can say Wheelie is acting as a momentum pump. So this is like, for instance, you have water that goes downhill spontaneously. But in order to get it uphill, you need a pump. Entropy goes alone from high to low temperature. In order to get it from low to high, you need an entropy pump or heat pump. You see, all, all these persons are acting as an entropy pump. Now, let us consider a car, a normal car, with front wheel drive. If it accelerates, then entropy, uh, momentum is going from the earth in the car from low to high velocity. And here also you have a pump for it, that's the motor of the car. And in this context, you can make a, uh, quite a, a lot of experiments. For instance, uh, this one. This is a toy, uh, um. toy car, small one. You put it on a cardboard, and these are straws. And with a remote, with a remote command, you switch it on. And then what happens is, whoosh, so you see the motor of the car is pumping momentum from the earth or from the cardboard into the car. Now it depends on what your pupils know already. If at that moment you do not want to speak about energy, just let it in the way you have explained it. Otherwise you can introduce energy uh, or you can speak about energy. In order to get momentum from low to high velocity, you, know, you need a pump and the pump needs energy to, to do its work. Well, anyway, uh, momentum goes spontaneously from high to low velocity. In order to get it to high velocity, you need a momentum pump. Momentum needs an energy supply. 
just as a water pump needs an energy supply yeah. or just as a heat pump needs an energy supply, a heat pump. So as a result, we have a momentum pump, for instance, an electric motor, brings momentum from a body, oh, <laughs> you can read that. So now a little change of the um, level of interaction because notice on the right, that's for you not for the children. And this five is the numbering of these uh, remarks in the... What we have been teaching up till, until now was approximately four hours of classroom teaching. And we learned many things, well, four hours is not much, but we learned many things about momentum, its flow, and so on. And now it would be an interesting question, but what about Newton's laws? Yeah, there are so many processes and you did not mention Newton's laws. So the answer is that, or in, in order to see what happens with Newton's laws is that we have to translate them into momentum current language. So I will write down now Newton's laws first in its usual, in its traditional form and then in its translated form, just the same content, but another wording corresponding uh, uh, to the momentum. Uh, yeah. The first reads like this, approximately. A body remains in a state of rest or of uniformly moving straight forward as long as no force is Newton Now I give the translation, not into Chinese, but the translation into the momentum <laughs> picture. Uh, yeah. Did you read it already, the blue one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, bodies. Did you say it in Chinese? No, 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 no. Because uh, some uh, no. yeah, misunderstanding. Uh, yeah, just a body's momentum does yeah. not change yeah. as long as no momentum enters or leaves the body. It's the same physics. Only this is uh, said with the Newton's words when using the word force. And when using the word momentum current, it reads like this. The same physical content. Well, the second law, and I give it in the translated version, the time rate of change, the period of the momentum of a body is equal to. I hope uh, it is possible to see that these are the same, uh, expresses the same facts. Now comes the third uh, law of Newton, which is a little more difficult to translate. Uh, a, except, can you try to, for instance, the Earth and the Moon. If a body A exerts a force on body B, then B exerts a force on A, and they are equal in amount. Mm. This reads in a momentum current picture, surprising perhaps, when momentum is flowing from A to B, the momentum current entering body B is equal to the current leaving body A. Imagine these two bodies, if they are gravitationally attracting, then of course this momentum increases, this decreases. So there's a momentum flow through the gravitational field and the third new of, uh, law of Newton says the momentum that leaves the body, that leaves this, the momentum that's flowing out of the body, it's the same as that that's coming, coming in. Well, I hope that you could understand all these three sentences. Now, if you look at them all together, then you will notice that all of the three sentences do only express momentum conservation. Let me express this with water. Instead of momentum, we speak about water. You have a buck with water. The amount of water does not change as long as no water goes in or goes out. The first fundamental law of water bucks. The time rate of change of the amount of water is equal the, the change of water is equal to the flow the, to the water flow that comes in. There's a second law of water bucks. Now I have two water bucks and they are connected. 
and water is flowing from here to here. And the third law says that the water flow here is the same as here. Now, if you ask what kind of laws are these, then you can say it is simply the fact that the, the amount of water is conserved. If it were not conserved, then it would be possible that the flow here is not the same as here. If on the way water disappears. Let us play the game just once more with electricity. We are, I said it already, we are experts in analogies. So, um, here are again the, the three laws we just have seen, the same. I copied it on, on this transparency. But now we will replace the word momentum not by water but by electric charge. So a body's, not momentum, a body's electric charge does not change as long as no electric charge enters or leaves the body. The time rate of change, d, q dt, of the electric charge of a body is equal to the electric current entering or leaving the body, d, q dt. You can ask yourself, are these statements true? The answer is, of course they are true. Let us translate the last one. When electric charge is flowing from body A to body B, the electric charge, no, the electric current entering body B is equal to the current leaving body A. <coughs> so you see, you can formulate the analogous laws for electricity. So when formulating or when treating electricity, you could introduce these three laws and you could say these are the three most important laws of the whole of physics because that's exactly what we say when we introduce them in mechanics. These are the basic of the whole of physics when we speak about momentum. So nobody would formulate electricity in this way because these are simple conclusions from the principle of charge conservation. So when pupils know charge cannot be created and cannot be destroyed, it is a simple uh, consequence, uh, or these three sentences are simple consequences of it. And in the same way, in mechanics, when the students have a good idea of the conservation of momentum, of its substance-like character and of its conservation, they do not need the formulation of three laws, laws of Newton. Uh, she asked a question. Uh, the example you have given just now, when you uh, pull the wagon, mm -hmm. and then the momentum flow from the earth through you to the wagon, and he, she can also understand uh, how, how does the momentum flow from you, uh, from the earth to you and then to the wagon. And uh, she also asked, uh, uh, she, she think about uh, do uh, you do work on the wagon? You uh, here your energy is transferred to the wagon, and maybe she can understand this. I can not understand how does the momentum flow. Well, now I do not know if uh, the translation of what arrived in my <laughs> ears is exactly the same. How does the momentum pump work? This is very, very complicated. But the situation is just as if we speak about pumping water and I buy a water pump in the supermarket and in general I do not know, know how the pump works. So we are at this state, at some later state we can ask how can we construct a water pump? But for the moment, we just know the pump does what we want. Momentum goes in at a low velocity, comes out at a high velocity, and unfortunately, the pump needs to be plugged into the, uh, to, 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 to the electricity because it needs energy. Now, you, apparently, you also asked for the energy balance. Uh, you said um, yeah. the person does work on the, uh, or um, realizes work on the wagon. Mm. Now first, there is a marginal remark that I want to, ma to make. 
that we do not use the term work because this is the, the ancient way of expressing that there's an energy current flowing through the string. Just another word, way of wording, but notice that the word work, doing work, A does work on B, dates from a time before energy was introduced in physics, before 1850. That's why in, the, in KPK you will never find the, the expression uh, doing work on something, but we always say energy is going from A to B. Yeah. However, I think this was not the essence of your question. Your question was about the energy balance of the thing in general. Uh, and here the answer is energy comes later in the course. One, but this gives me a, an opportunity to make another comment of the whole structure of the course. We, what we want when doing mechanics, what we want is to get a solid association with our ideas of movement and with momentum of physics, with the physical quantity P. That is why for, I think, at least 10 lessons, we do not speak about energy, only we make momentum balances. We only ask for momentum. And, and in and the same way, when doing thermodynamics, you will see there are at least eight lessons, or also ten, where we only ask for what is the entropy going, from where to where is it going. We have seen that energy is in all the different parts of, of physics is important. So when doing mechanics, there are two substance like quantities which are important and we have to learn about where they go from where to where and so on. Momentum and energy. In thermodynamics, you have to do with two substance like quantities. One is entropy, one is energy. In electricity, by the way, now it is an important problem in teaching. And you will have this problem with however you do it, KPK or not KPK, that the two substance like quantities can be easily confused in our heads. In order to make a good and complete description, you need both of them. The tendency for everyone who tries to learn, for every pupil, is to, f to believe or to try to describe a phenomenon, phenomenon with only one substance-like quantity. And this is, this is the reason uh, that in all these three subfields, uh, pupils often confuse these, these two quantities. And not only pupils confuse them, but also often teachers, teachers or physicists. And in particular, in the history of physics, historical development, this was a great problem to, to understand that we need always two substance-like quantities to describe a simple process. I will give you examples for all the three subfields where this confusion can be observed. I begin with electricity because this is an example that you all know. Consider a simple electric circuit. When teaching that, pupils have to learn that something is flowing. Yeah, and then we say, well, th there's flowing something that's called electricity. Now, I don't know in Chinese language, but for instance, in English, when people speak about electricity, what, which physical quantity do they associate with this? I don't know if you know. And they say charge. The charge, yeah. yeah. That's typically the answer of the physicist. Uh, now, read the newspapers. And then you will learn that power plants produce electricity. So apparently they mean something else than Q. What they mean is electric energy. And now we, the poor teachers, have the problem. We are beginning with introducing the electric current. And our first problem is to show them that the intensity of the current here is the same as here. 
but every reasonable student knows that something is going from here to here because the battery gets empty. So, so therefore, students often believe here the current intensity is higher than there. And it's hard for the teacher to explain to them that the intensity here is the same as there because he did not yet speak about energy. So it is extremely important here to say from the beginning that there are two substance-like quantities. One is going around and the other one is going from here to there. This is the energy and this is the electric charge. And this problem is caused, of course, by the everyday wording, which you read the newspapers, what you learn in physics, it is in conflict with one another. But I think the general tendency is our, well, that we try to describe the whole thing with only one uh, uh, extensive quantity. So it is, it is extremely important for t teaching that students know that for every phenomenon, phenomenon you know it need for a description two substance-like quantity. It's a very important rule in KPK. It is stressed um, ever and ever again, two substance-like quantities, and always the students have to tell me what is the way of the one, what is the way of the other. So I said that there have been problems of confusion between these in all of these three subfields of physics, and we just talked about this one. This one is particularly interesting for those who are interested in the history of physics. Yesterday I mentioned that the momentum for the first time was introduced or invented by Descartes. Well, he defined as a measure of the quantity of movement m times v. Unfortunately, I forgot the life dates. But you don't, uh, when he was living, it was 1600 something. This is, this is important to know. So, he, invent, he invented or he defined this as a measure for the momentum. In Latin, quantitas motus is what called by him. Quantitas is quantity, motus is movement. Not this was momentum. relatively accepted at the time. And, but then about a hundred years later, not exactly, there was another philosopher whose name is Leibniz. This guy was French, this one was German. And he also was interested in the laws of mechanics. And he was always looking for a measure of this. Uh -huh. And he pretended that the true measure of the f movement is this. We can ask, what were they looking at? Ah, and he pre pretended this is not correct. This Order. is correct. You can imagine that both of them based their conclusion on different experiments. And of course, we are now much more we, uh, um, intelligent. We know much more than those two guys because we recognize that is what we call today momentum and that is what today we call kinetic energy to within a factor of a half. And but, and essentially. but in history there was a strong controversy between these two schools. Leibniz was fighting against, not Descartes, he was dead already, but his followers. And it was a, fi a famous scientific dispute which was known under the name the dispute about the true measure of force. By the way, you see that what they meant by force was this. And when there was a dispute, they believed that there was only one substance-like quantity. Because otherwise, today we know we have both of them. This is momentum, this is energy. But the idea was there can exist only one substance-like quantity that describes movements. Well, so far about mechanics. Again, our tendency to try to describe a process by making the balance of only one quantity, but we need two. The situation is in a certain sense completely different and in another sense very similar in thermodynamics. It was mentioned already yesterday 
that in the ancient times, around um, 1700, there was introduced a measure for what in everyday terms we would call heat. If you read the old literature, then, and you ask what they called heat, to which of the contemporary, quanto, to the actual quantities does it correspond? Then you will find it is not the quantity which we call Q today. It is this one. So, but then, in 1850, energy was introduced into physics. Energy came into physics. And um, physicists introduced a quantity heat, which they called Q, as an energy form. And they did not notice that this new quantity was not identical with this one. Because, again, the idea was that there is only one um, quantity necessary to describe heat. And so, the entropy, which had been in physics already, with another name, disappeared. And it was a new introduced by Clausius with this symbol. <clears throat> I'm not sure about the year around this. So, and only then we knew that there are two quantities are necessary. Yesterday you learned already that unfortunately the word heat was given to this quantity, but it would have been better to call this heat. So to, to resume, in all of physics, ever and ever again, it happened that people tried to describe a class of phenomena with one extensive quantity, whereas you need, actually, you need two, and it is very easy to confuse them. Thus, when teaching, we not only have to pay attention that this uh, confusion does not occur, we really have to develop strategies which help the students to distinguish between these two. Well, I, I cannot explain now all the strategies in KPK because, you know, it's a five volumes book, it is complicated, but one of these is that first, when doing mechanics, first establish a solid idea about momentum. And in thermodynamics, first establish a solid idea of the concept of entropy. And only after about 10 hours of teaching, introduce energy. So that was a long answer to a short question. Yeah. Uh, I hope you have seen that the question was an important one. Again, you might think, oh, perhaps it's a stupid question. I am not asked. I mean, yesterday you have give, given them an uh, example about the uh, flower pot on the mm -hmm. table and you draw the uh, force diagram and then you ex explain this uh, situation by momentum and they, sh they understand. And the question is if the, you, you are pulling the wagon now and the wagon is uh, accelerated. Uh, you, you're pulling the object, you're mm. pulling the object, mm. and the speed, yeah, yeah. it is accelerated, and they want to know uh, exactly how does the momentum is flowing. And maybe they want to compare also with the force. Yeah. yeah. So now, as a good teacher, I say, this is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so the first to give comfort to the pupils, and now, in this situation, the, the, the teacher often has two possibilities. Either he says, um, oh, we will do this later, or he gives a very short answer. Because the point is that uh, exactly about that we will speak in one of the next lessons. So in this case, I would say, please wait this afternoon, and then this is exactly our subject. And if you then still remains with the question, then you ask it again. Yeah, but it's indeed, it's a good question because it shows that um, now you are at a point of understanding mm. where naturally you ask for this. And then when teaching, yeah, it's the next one we, we speak it's about. Uh, yeah, Professor Hammond, uh, I would like to...
<laughs> to something different. Because as I guess the lady, uh, she, the first thing she said is she was so convinced by the example you given, given by you yesterday about the vase, flower vase. You said that if you explain the four forces by using the momentum current, it's a much simpler mm. and uh, reasonable. Now her question is, can you use the, the energy current flow to explain when the body is, is moving, you know? Then how the, the, the momentum current uh, is, is flowing? It, it's such a, I think it's just simpler. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. Actually, you have a... Yes, but I remain, with, I remain with my answer. That's exactly yes, what yes, we are yes. doing, um, not next, but after the next chapter. Gong, Gong, Gong Zhuo is work. The, the, the question is still about the uh, momentum pump and the mechanism. It's not about the standard, how does the momentum flow? Mm -hmm. Because just now you use analog large pump, mm -hmm. the node of how that large pump works. works. <coughs> We do not know exactly how that the momentum flows. How can the momentum flow from the earth to the person and then to the car? Yeah. But do they know how a battery works? An electricity pump. How does the electricity pump work? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, we can see the flow. Yeah, yeah. But we cannot see something is flowing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <coughs>